Okay, uh, Boker Tov, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome in via Zoom for Shemuel Aleph, Perek Kaf. We're studying the book of Shemuel, uh, chapter 20. Um, feel free, if you have a uh, question, to uh, unmute yourself and, and go ahead and ask as we go through uh, studying this, uh, what is a long chapter together. Hopefully, we'll get through it all. Uh, if not, we'll pause in the middle and pick up next week. Uh, but let's see how we do. Um, to refresh our memories, chapter 19, uh, the uh, divide between Shaul and David, to say the least, continues to grow. Shaul um, outwardly uh, says that he wants to kill David. He makes several attempts to kill David. Um, he does take an oath at one point to not kill David, but as we see, he continues to send messengers to retrieve David. He tries to kill him in the middle, in, in, the, in the early hours of the morning. David has to sneak out and run away. So several attempts are made by Shaul via messengers and himself um, to take David's life. The chapter culminates in Shaul uh, in a, in a uh, prophetic frenzy together with Shemuel and all of those other messengers that are around them. Um, despite several attempts to uh, get at David, we find that Shaul is unsuccessful. And that's really where the chapter ends, really talking about the deterioration of where Shaul has come to. What's going to be interesting is chapter 20 now that we're going to read is going to pick up and is going to be very inconsistent with what we've seen in chapter 19 so far. In other words, there's going to be a lot of choppiness to the order of events that are going on. It's going to seem very strange, some of the conversations that we have, which uh, seem to not take into account what's going on in previous chapters. And so we're going to have to try and explain uh, what's going on. To me, the centerpiece of chapter 20 that we're going to keep an eye on is the relationship between David and Yonatan. So while Shaul is going to play a role here, really chapter 20 is a turning point between the relationship uh, of David and Yonatan and the complexities that their relationship has, given that they are a, uh, a triangle between David, Yonatan, and Shaul. Uh, and really the person who we're going to focus on is Yonatan. Yonatan is stuck in the middle of a complicated relationship between him and his father and him and his best friend. And how this triangle plays itself out is going to be very interesting throughout the chapter. And we'll see where we get to uh, by the end of it. You'll see where the relationship sort of takes a turn. So why don't we dive right into the psukim. Uh, you can see them on the screen that I've shared with you. Um, I'm also reading from the, uh, as we've been doing, from the uh, Hebrew-English Sax Tanakh uh, from Koran. I'm on page 687, if you happen to have that uh, at home. Otherwise, you could follow along with me in whatever Tanakh you have, or on the screen with the Psukim as I go about them one by one. So the Pasuk tells us, David minayot barama. We last left off with David in a place called Nayot in Ramah. That's where he was hiding out with Shemuel. And after Shaul is unsuccessful at attacking David there, David runs away from Nayot Barama, Vayavo, and he comes. But it doesn't really tell us where he comes. He just comes to meet up with his friend Yonatan. Vayomer lifne Yonatan. He says before his friend Yonatan, Me'asiti, what have I done? Me'avoni, what sin have I committed? Me'hatati, what crime am I guilty of? Lifne avicha, before your father, kimevakeshet nafshi, that he should seek my life to want to kill me. David expresses his frustration towards his friend Yonatan as to why he is being chased and desired to be killed by Yonatan's father, Shaul. Basically, David is placing a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the onus on Yonatan here, saying, you know, Yonatan, why is your dad trying to do this to me? Give me an explanation. And he's putting Yonatan in a difficult spot. Yonatan oddly enough, tries to deny Shaul's motivations. He says to him, Heaven forbid, you're not going to die. Behold, my father is not going to do a big thing or a small thing. Without the first disclosing it to my ears. Why would my father conceal such a matter from me? It cannot be. This is strange. Yonatan seems to be in denial about his father's actions to kill David, despite the fact that in last chapter, Shaul told Yonatan outright that he wanted to kill David and made several attempts on David's life personally and through messengers. 
this seems very, very odd. It almost seems as though Yonatan is not in, uh, in check with reality uh, or needs a reality check that I, I, may, I may say, right? Uh, what, what is he talking about? And David is equally uh, displeased with this answer. Um, we got to have to figure out what it is that Yonatan is telling David over here. He's trying to say, my father wouldn't do anything without telling me, but this seems to be oblivious to the current situation. Um, verse 3, Vayishava od David. David further swears or makes him take an oath. Vayomer, and he says, Yadoa yada avicha ki matzati hen be'enecha. David explains to Yonatan why his father Shaul would not tell him. He says, because your father knows that you have found favor in my eyes. He knows that we're friends. Vayomer, and he has said to himself, Ali yada zot Yonatan pen ya'atsev. I'm going to make attempts on David's life. But I'm not going to tell Yonatan, my son, because he might get upset. He'd be grieved over the fact that I want to kill his best friend. But as the Lord lives and as you live, there's only one step between me and death. In other words, David is saying to Yonatan, Yonatan, you don't see this correctly. Your father's not going to tell you that he wants to kill me. He's going to hide it from you. He is not going to disclose it to you. Because he doesn't want you to be upset over the fact that he wants to kill your best friend. But I'm telling you that it's been known to me through several attempts on my life, and maybe other officers are telling me, I'm but a step away from death. Your father really has it in for me. Verse 4, Vayomer Yonatan el David, ma tomar nafshecha ve'e'eselach. So Yonatan says to David, whatever you want, I will do it for you. And now they're going to make a test to determine whether in fact Shaul indeed wants to kill uh, David or not. And again, this seems to be very strange and not in keeping with what we've seen in prior chapters. It seems obvious to us, the reader, to every member of the story, including Yonatan himself, that his father Shaul wishes to kill David. Why all of a sudden is there ambiguity over Shaul's intentions at this point, such that we have to have a swear and Yonatan says, tell me what to do. And we're going to see now David is going to craft another scenario, as we've seen in previous chapters, to expose the intentions of Yonatan's father, Shaul. And so this once again seems very, very odd. We're piling up questions here, but we're not giving any answers just yet. I'd like to keep reading a few pisukim and seeing further and further um, how odd this chapter is. But so far in just reading the first four opening verses, it's obvious to us that something is not adding up over here. Based on what we read in the last several chapters, there's a choppiness to the flow of the events over here, and there seems to be a lot of ambiguity and obliviousness to what's happened beforehand. Let's leave those questions on the side for the moment, and let's continue reading in the Pesukim and see if after we read another section, we can maybe double back to try and find some answers. David el Yonatan. So David says to Yonatan, Okay, Yonatan, tomorrow is Rosh Chodesh. And I am due to sit with the king and eat. Already we should pause there. What in the world is going on? David is supposed to sit at the table of Shaul and eat with him? It's obvious that David has been trying to run away from Shaul and escape Shaul's clutches. Why all of a sudden is David supposed to eat together with Shaul at his table? Again, more bizarre language over here that is difficult for the reader to comprehend. But we move forward. So instead of sitting with the king, as I'm supposed to, says David, uh, instead, let me go. Send me away. And I will hide in the field until the third evening. So they were about to celebrate Rosh Chodesh for two days and two nights. By the third evening, obviously, someone will come to seek out David. David is supposed to be at some point within the festivities of the king over these next two days. And David is not going to show up. And what do they want to see by this? Verse 6. David says to Yonatan, if your father notes my absence, you should say, David surely requested for me to run back to his hometown in Bethlehem. Because there, they have an annual sacrifice that they perform as a family. In other words, David wanted to go back home for his once-a-year family get-together to have a korban and to eat together with them. And David requested that this Rosh Chodesh, he should go back to his family 
to participate in that sacrifice and in that family meal. So David is saying to Yonatan to tell Shaul an excuse as to why David is not there, that he's going to go home to his family. And Yonatan gave him permission to do so. What they want to test is what Shaul's reaction will be to this. If your father should say, Tov, that's okay, good, shalom le'avdecha, may there be peace on your servant, then we know that, uh, that he doesn't want to kill me. But if it should anger him as to what you respond, then we will know that he is resolved in his heart to do me harm. So they want to test Shaul's reaction to David's absence at a meal in which he should be partaking with the king. Again, it is still not clear to us why David would be in the house of Shaul to begin with. Perhaps these events happened earlier. It's, it's very, uh, very difficult to understand. Verse 8, al You shall perform kindness with your servant. Since you have taken a covenant together with your servant. Let's not forget that several chapters ago, Yonatan and David struck a berit, a covenant with each other, that they will remain loyal to each other, despite the fact that they probably anticipated some tension going on in this triangle between Yonatan, David, and Shaul. And if I should be guilty of something and have transgressed something, then David tells Yonatan, you put me to death. But to bring me to your father, why should you do such a thing? A very, very strange line on the part of David towards his best friend, Yonatan. You put me to death if I've done anything wrong, but don't bring me to the hands of your father? What a strange thing for David to say to Yonatan. It's almost as if David shows a little bit of suspicion in Yonatan. Maybe a sense that Yonatan might be cracking at the demands of his father. Maybe Yonatan is not as loyal as we once thought, despite the berit. We don't know exactly, but it sounds as if David is putting a little bit of pressure, uh, a little bit of concern at where exactly Yonatan's loyalty, in fact, lies. To which in verse 9, Yonatan responds adamantly, Vayomer Yonatan halilalach. Yonatan says to him, I refuse for you to speak that way. It's Khalila. Heaven forbid that a person should speak like that to somebody who made a covenant with him. If I indeed learn that my father's patience has run out with you and he desires to put you to harm, would I not tell it to you? Of course I will tell it to you. In other words, it sounds as though David is saying to Yonatan, I'm not so sure I can trust you to tell me if your father indeed wanted to kill me. Where does your loyalty 100% lie? And Yonatan unequivocally tells David, if I should uncover and expose my father's plot to harm you, I will, of course, go ahead and tell you. David seems unconvinced, however. David says to Yonatan in verse 10, Pasuk Yod, but who is going to inform me? Who is going to tell me if your father answers you harshly? In other words, David seemingly recognizes Yonatan, you might not be in a position to really be able to tell me. Is this something you could really tell to me? Are you really able to expose your father's desire to me? Verse 11, Pasuk Yir Aleph, Vayomer Yonatan el David, Yonatan says to David, Lecha venetzeha sadeh, let's go out to the field. In other words, let's talk maybe in private. And the two of them go out to the field. I'd like to just pause here for a moment before we read a little bit more about what Yonatan and David set up over here and how they further this discussion. This has been a very odd opening to a pedic, first 11 verses. We're having trouble pinpointing when these actions are taking place. There doesn't seem to be a continuity to the events from the previous chapter. Yonatan and David's loyalty seems to be a little bit disrupted, or at least in question. What exactly um, is happening over here? So before we move any further, I'd like to share with you the approach of the Radak, Rabbi David Kimhi. Before I do so, I just want to see if anybody has any questions or concerns or thoughts to add before I share with you uh, the Radak's approach to what is taking place over here. 
Okay. So I won't read to you the entire Radak, but I will uh, read to you a few things uh, that I have over here in my book. I, I have to find the Radak um, inside. Let's see if I could pull it up over here on our, me, on our, um, on our screen. I want to find the exact spot. Okay. Um, I think it's in this long one. Okay. Um, the Radak starts out with a number of different questions. Let me open this up a little bit so that our viewers can see a little bit better. Um, the Radak says, How is Yonatan seemingly making oaths and, and promises to David about something that seems false? He says, oh, my father wouldn't tell me. Everybody sees that Shaul is trying to chase after David. What's happening over here? Yonatan believes his father's oath that he took in last chapter that Shaul refuses to kill David. I swear on God that he should not die. So what's been happening over here? That's what she's been throwing the spear and sword at him despite having made an oath. And that which Shaul had sent messengers to guard and surveillance David and to put him to death. And that which he's chased after him to put him to death. Yonatan is compartmentalizing his father's actions. Yonatan is saying, when my father is clear-minded and level-headed, he took an oath that he will not transgress. He will not kill David. All of these attempts on David's life are when the ruach ra'a, the evil spirit, grips over Shaul, and Shaul is not in control over his, over his actions. He's not lucid and clear thinking. So Yohanatan is not blaming his father for what he's doing because something has gripped him that is beyond his control. What he's saying to David is, David is claiming Shaul wants to kill me no matter what even without the Ruach Ra'ah. And Yonatan is saying, I don't believe it. It's only because of the Ruach Ra'ah that he wants to kill you. Without the Ruach Ra'ah, my father has made an oath and he's not going to kill you. So there are splitting hairs over here. And he's telling David, David, he only gets the Ruach Ra'ah every so often, very rarely. As the Pasuk says, only at certain times does he get these bouts of Ruach Ra'ah. And that's when he needs David to play the harp in front of him. That's why he had David there. We don't find that he wanted to kill him after the oath. So that's why Yonatan is coming and promising David that he can protect David from Shaul. Why? Yonatan says, I can hide you around and I can keep you away from my father as long as I see that he has a Ruach Ra'ah. What about the fact that David is his harp player? Even though David is usually playing the harp in front of him at that time. Yonatan says, I'll keep a closer eye on my father and make sure that he won't come against you. But Shaul indeed wanted to kill him, even without the Ruach Ra'a. And in here lies a shift according to the Nadak. That in fact, Shaul now has in his mind, even when he's thinking without Ruach Ra'a, that he wishes to kill David. And so we may not see again the Ruach Ra'a come on to Shaul when he wants to kill him. We may just see Shaul chasing after him to kill him regardless of the Ruach Ra'a. Shaul, however, was concealing that thought from his son Yonatan, because he took an oath, that Yonatan would not be grieved. So this is at the heart of the conflict between David and Yonatan. According to the Radak, if we summarized it, the Radak is saying that the difference between Yonatan and David is they both know that Shaul has made attempts on David's life. That is not something that is hidden from them. Nobody is oblivious to that fact. However, the question is, what's been the motivation to attack David? Until this point, Yonatan understands that it's just the Ruach Ra'ah and that Shaul's oath that he has taken to not harm David 
is applicable even in this situation as long as there's no ruach ra'a. To which Yonatan promises he's going to keep a closer eye on his father and protect David from Shaul and the ruach ra'a, even when it should be upon him. And apparently this was enough to perhaps convince David to come back to the palace of Yonatan, of, of Shaul, and to be with him, despite the fact that he knew that he wanted to kill him. To which David is now growing more and more suspicious of Shaul, feeling as though Shaul wants to kill him, not simply because of the ruach ra'a, but because he has it in for him. And that is what they're trying to figure out now. What they're trying to figure out, as opposed to the previous chapters, is does Shaul have intense intentions to kill David, regardless of whether there's a ruach ra'a, or is it just the ruach ra'a that's motivating him? And as a result, one just needs to protect David during those rare moments of ruach ra'a, otherwise he can still coexist together with Shaul. This is the fundamental debate that the Radak says is going on here, um, in this chapter, and it helps us to put together a little bit of the story that's taking place over here. Tell me if the Radak makes sense, if you find questions here, if anything bothers you, um, if that explanation is satisfactory. Okay, so in that case, we will press on a little bit more. I believe, however, the Radak's explanation is a good one, but it does lack um, some pizzazz to it. It does lack a little bit in that uh, we don't really see it so much written here about the Ruach Ra'a. His whole explanation really depends on how we understand this Ruach Ra'a situation, but it's not really mentioned over here. And Shaul, excuse me, Yonatan has to take on another oath and another berit. Why does he need more oaths? Why is what we've done in the previous chapters not enough? It seems as though there's a little bit more here that the text wants to teach us. I believe what's really at the heart of this, more so than just the what does Shaul think, what does he not think, is it Ruach Ra'a, does he want to kill David? I don't think that Shaul is the centerpiece of this chapter. I think that the centerpiece of this chapter is Yonatan and David. What's happening here is that the story is now being told from a slightly different perspective. Until now, the story had been told as Yonatan is the driving force about figuring out what's taking place behind the scenes with Shaul and David. And he's been the advisor to David about what to do. And in this chapter, it switches. Now, all of a sudden, Yonatan is saying, tell me what to do and I'll do it. Yonatan is the reactor. He is not the proactor. The proactive person in this chapter is David. And David is the one who wants to uncover a little bit more about what's going on. And David is now putting a lot of onus on Yonatan and saying to Yonatan, where does your loyalty lie? Can I trust you? Is the berit and the shivua that, we're be, that we've been making, is it reliable over here for us to depend on it? Because David recognizes that, Sha, that Yonatan is in an impossible situation. Yonatan has to balance between his loyalty to his father and the love that he has to his father and the natural honor and kavod that he has to show towards his father. At the same time, recognizing that his best friend David is really in the right over here and his loyalty and berit to him. And that's why David keeps throwing these questions towards Yonatan. Are you really so certain, Yonatan, that your father would tell you everything? Your loyalty has been towards me. Are you really going to tell me if your father is exposed that he wants to kill me? How do I know that that's going to happen? Make another oath with me. David is challenging Yonatan to up the ante on his loyalty towards him because Yonatan is really in an impossible situation. Let's continue reading the chapter and see how this relationship and how this impossible situation continues to further and progress as more and more strain is placed upon it. So we're together here in chapter 12, in, in uh, Pasuk 12, Pasuk Yirbet of chapter 20. Vayomer Yonatan el David. Yonatan now says to David, Adonai Elohei Israel ki echkor et avi ka'et mahana shlishit v'hinetov el David. Yonatan says to David, in the name of God, by the Lord, the God of Israel, I will sound out my father at this time tomorrow. In other words, I'll investigate the situation. As you said, tomorrow at the dinner on, of the Rosh Chodesh, I will find out what my father's true intentions are. Um, if his response is favorable, I will send you a message. And I will disclose it to you. So here's interesting, whereas Yonatan had promised to tell David directly, he now says to him, I will uncover my father's uh, true desires. 
And if they're good, I will send a message to you. I will send someone to come and tell you and disclose to you. Yonatan is somewhat, uh, you know, balancing between the two, but he's saying that ultimately his loyalty lies with David. Verse 13. But if such will God shall do to Yonatan and such he shall continue. This is a language which is consistent with a language of shivua, a language of swearing or taking an oath. We find a similar language in the Migilat Ruk, which was also written by Shemuel, just as this book was written by Shemuel. It was a language of the time to express what uh, Hashem will do and an oath in the name of Hashem. Um, if my father intends to do you harm, may the Lord do thus to Yonatan, and more if I do not disclose it to you. In other words, Yonatan says, I will meet the same fate as my father. The punishment, the wrath of God will be upon me should I find out that my father has bad intentions for you and I don't tell them to you. I will send you off and allow you to escape harm and to go in peace. God shall be with you in the same way that he is with, that he was with my father. Um, just take a step back for a minute and think of the emotion in, in Yonatan's uh, heart as he says those words, that God should be with you the way he was with my father. Notice the past tense, was with my father. You can hear uh, almost the voice of Yonatan crack, the heartbreak that he experiences in saying to this, that while his loyalty is pledged to David and he promises to disclose everything to David and he blesses David that Hashem should be with him, it was Hashem should be with you the way he was with my father. There's a sense of lamentation over there, of mourning, of grief on the part of Yonatan of what could have been for his father and for him had his father stayed true to the word of Hashem and not deteriorated to this point. Despite the fact that Yonatan is saying he's going to get sent him messengers, we see Yonatan's loyalty is with David. Verse 14, nor shall I fail to show me the Lord's faithfulness while I am alive, nor when I am dead. Notice the words velo happening a lot over here. The, Yonatan is speaking in double negatives. If I do not remain alive, God will not do any chesed with me, which means if I remain alive and true to you, God will do chesed. And if I will not die, the, your kindness will not be cut together, will not be severed or detached or discontinued with your, with your offspring for all eternity. In other words, what Yonatan is saying to David is, as long as I remain alive, Hashem will do chesed together with me and with you, and we will be bonded together. As long as I do not die, our bond will never be cut, neither with us nor with our children. So now the oath is extending not only to David and Yonatan themselves, but also beyond that to their lineage and to their children. Neither when David's enemies will be cut down, each person from the land. And this is a painful statement for Yonatan to make because who is Oive David? Who are the enemies of David? Right now, there's only one. It's Shaul, Yonatan's father, whom he knows will eventually be cut down and destroyed for seeking to harm David, the next king of Am Yisrael. What Yonatan is expressing over here is a little bit of fear from himself. Yonatan wonders back to David. As much as David is challenging him about where his loyalty lies, and whether Yonatan will remain true to David, Yonatan fires back a little bit here underhanded towards David. And he says, David, will you guarantee that when you become king, you will not seek to cut me down? After all, I am the son of your sworn enemy. Maybe you're going to cut me down. It was the way of kings that when one king would take the throne, he would remove immediately by way of death penalty all kings and all, all other people related to the previous king. They would just wipe them out. So there should be no threat to the new king who ascended the throne. So, and we'll see, by the way, later on, that when David hands it over to Shalomo, Shalomo is going to wipe away all the other people who potentially threaten to rebel against him and so on and so forth. So this was a common practice of kings that when they got the throne, they would get rid of all their detractors, all those who were potentially a threat upon the, uh, the, the, the uh, faithfulness of their kingdom, the strength of their kingdom. So Yonatan says to David, David, do I have your oath back towards me that as long as I'm alive, you'll do kindness with me? 
that as long as I'm not dead, you will not cut off your kindness together with me and my children, that you will consider me to be a part of your kingdom? Do I have that from you? And in fact, he does, because in verse 16, by Yichrot Yehonatan in Bet David, Yonatan and David make a covenant with each other, but not just with each other, in Bet David, with the house of David. In other words, this is a covenant that's going to extend beyond just David and Yonatan themselves, but also to their children. And may the Lord requite the enemies of David. Verse 17, Vayosef Yonatan Hashbia et David. Yonatan continues to cause David to take an oath. Because of the love that he had for him. Because they had a true love. He loved him as he loved himself. So this section sort of ends over here with a hard conversation between Yonatan and David, a difficult conversation between true friends with each other. Friends who have a complex relationship because of the noise surrounding them, because of the people they're related to, because of the challenges that they're currently facing. Can their friendship, the bond that they have, withstand the tension that is being placed on it by the fact that the David, is Yonatan's best friend, um, his mortal enemy is Yonatan's father. How will they respond to this? And the tensions that you can see are there. Each one kind of concerned about the other. And finally, the section ends with Yonatan pledging his utmost loyalty to David and David cutting an oath with Yonatan, not just himself, but also with their lineage uh, as a show of the love that they have for each other and that their bonds will continue to endure. And so that's what I think is at the heart of this chapter. And that's what is going to continue to be at the heart of this chapter. Um, we've only read about half the chapter, but already I think the major theme of what this chapter is all about is very evident. It's all about not so much the continuity of events that's going on. And it's not really about Shaul's pursuit of David. It's really about Yonatan and David and their friendship withstanding the complexities that are being thrown at them. The loyalty that they could have for each other, despite the fact that there is a very difficult balance, which one character in particular, Yonatan, has to strike. The loyalty to his father and the loyalty to his best friend. We will see this continue to develop in the chapter. And unfortunately, I will, I will uh, present at the end why um, Yonatan is a torn character and why ultimately he makes a choice in the eyes of the rabbis that they did not, uh, they were not pleased with. Let's go to verse 18. Verse 18, for the next several verses, we're going to talk about the narrative about how they exposed Shaul's true intentions. And we already saw that David put forth an idea about exposing it at the uh, Rosh Chodesh ceremony, the Rosh Chodesh festivities. And we're going to see Yonatan is going to reiterate that, but he's going to add in a few details uh, about how he's going to inform David. Let's read through it quickly. Yonatan says to David, tomorrow is Rosh Chodesh, as you said. And as you told me, you will be missed when your seat remains vacant. I'd like to just point out before we continue reading, these words, machar chodesh, are the source for why we read this part of the chapter anytime Rosh Chodesh falls out on a Sunday. If Rosh Chodesh falls out on a Sunday, so then on Shabbat, which is the day before, the haftarah for the parashat Shavua will be this section of chapter 20 of the book of Shemuel. Because the chapter, well, this section opens with the words, Machar Chodesh. So the rabbis instituted that anytime Rosh Chodesh is on a Sunday and we get the whole congregation together to read the Torah and say the Haftarah on Shabbat, the way we sort of announce that tomorrow is Rosh Chodesh to everybody is by reading this Haftarah, which is Machar Chodesh. Tomorrow is Rosh Chodesh. It really doesn't have much to do with Rosh Chodesh. Rosh Chodesh plays a very um, side role in how this is going to take place. It just happens to be that this whole thing is exposed at the Rosh Chodesh meal, but because of those words, Machar Chodesh, that is why we read this Haftarah when Rosh Chodesh falls out on Sunday. So next time you're in Shul, you'll note it. So Yonatan tells David, Machar Chodesh, tomorrow is Rosh Chodesh, your, your seat is going to remain vacant, and the situation is going to unfold. Verse 19, Pasuk Yutet, Veshilashta Tered Me'od. So the day after tomorrow, Veshilashta is from the word Shalosh, the day after tomorrow, on the third day, go down all the way, 
and come to the place where you're going to go into hiding, where the, the, the event is going to take place. And you're going to stay next to what is called the Evin Ha'azel. The Evin Ha'azel is a stone that we are familiar with. Earlier in the book of Shemuel, it was a place where the Jewish people made a conquest and they vanquished the Pelishti armies um, and chased them back all the way to Evin Ha'ezel. Um, verse 20, Yonatan, who we've seen already, is a very clever individual when it comes to coming up with signs. We saw him have a sign uh, earlier when it came to the, uh, conquering the Pelishti. He made this whole sign for himself. We saw that he made a sign in the last uh, chapter. In this chapter, he makes another sign to try and communicate something to David in an inconspicuous way. What is his sign? He says, I'm going to shoot three arrows in the field as though I were shooting at some kind of a mark. In other words, in a very inconspicuous way. And typically when a person did uh, arrow practice in the field, he would have an arms bearer who would accompany him to retrieve the bows and arrow. In verse 21, he says, I'm going to send the young man to go and find the arrows and bring them back to me, retrieve them. Im amor omar lanad, if I should say to the lad, the arrows are on this side of you. They're just past you a little bit. Kachenu, go and grab them. What should you do? Vavoa ki shalom lecha. You can know that you should come out of hiding and come because there's peace for you. The end davar, there's no issues. Chai Adonai, as the Lord lives, I swear by the name of God. The Imko Yomar, but verse 22, Imko Omar da Enen, if I should say to the young lad, the arrows are beyond you, you have to go chase them very, very far. Lech, then that's a sign to you, David, that you should run away and escape. Perhaps the sign of being far versus close. Close means you could stay close and you can come in and have hiding. Far means you have to go away, far and run away. Because God has sent you away. Verse 23, And as for the promise that we made to each other, May the Lord be a witness between you and me forever. So Yonatan crafts this interesting way about how he's going to inform David of the results of the test of Shaul and his intentions vis-a-vis -vis David. That was really the thing that was preying on David's mind. How could he trust Yonatan was one of his big deals? And how could he make sure that Yonatan will tell him and inform him? After all, David is sensitive to the fact that Yonatan, once Shaul tells him that he wants to kill David, Yonatan is going to have a hard time getting together with David and having a conversation. At that point, he cannot um, go against his father's words and his father's wishes to be in private and have a conversation together with David alone. It's going to be too difficult for them. David is respectful of the fact or practical, realistic about the fact that once Shaul tells Yonatan he wants to kill David, Yonatan will not be able to converse with David anymore. He will not be able to have an intimate relationship with David anymore. The tug of war between David and Shaul will be too challenging. Or he doesn't think maybe Yonatan could do it if he wanted to, but he doesn't expect perhaps Yonatan to defy his father and have a meeting in private with David. And so Yonatan himself, recognizing this, develops a code, develops a way in which he's going to inform David about Shaul's true intentions without having to converse with him from this day forward. Yonatan, in fact, gives in to that idea that David has of him and is basically saying, yes, David, this is how I'm going to have to tell you. I will inform you. And I will tell you the truth because I'm ultimately loyal to you. But Yonatan almost here has to play a double agent. He has to walk this fine line and therefore has to come up with this very convoluted way of inconspicuously telling David that his father does or does not want to kill him. Questions or comments or thoughts up to this point? Okay, so we're at Pasuk Kafdalid, making our way towards the end of the chapter. Let's see what happens. 
ויסתה דוד בשדה, ויהי החודש, וישב המלך אל הלחם לאכול. דוד goes and follows יונתן's plan, he hides in the field, and ראש חודש arrives, and the king sits at his table to eat his bread together with all his companions. Verse 25, וישב המלך על מושבו כפעם בפעם, the king took his usual place in his seat, as he did time and again. אל מושב הקיר, his seat was usually by the wall, apparently. Not clear why that detail needs to be there. ויקום יהונתן וישב אבנר מצד שאול. יהונתן gets up and he sits next to אבנר, and אבנר is next to שאול. ויפקד מקום דוד, and דוד's place is left vacant. דוד is not there. Once again, דוד apparently had a spot still remaining in שאול's place to be able to eat, um, because it has not been exposed yet that שאול wants to kill him despite not having a ruach ra'ah. So they see that David is not there. Verse 26, Shaul doesn't say anything on that day. He gives him the benefit of the doubt. It must be accidental. He must not be pure. Because he's not pure. So there's an interesting little statement there, right? Um, you could understand this simply that Shaul was saying, oh, he's not tahor. In other words, they only ate uh, the Rosh Chodesh Korban and things like that in a status of purity. So it happens from time to time a person becomes accidentally impure and cannot partake of the holy meal. And so you could say that Shaul is saying, okay, you know, he, he's built it tahor, lo tahor, he's not, he's not cleansed. Or I, I like to read this a little bit more like there was a subtle criticism over here. He's saying built it tahor, yeah, he's probably not tahor, he's probably not taking, I don't know, he's not really a pure guy, he's not tahor. There was a Criticism here, Shaul, you know, sort of backhandedly um, criticizes David while making a statement that could be understood one way or the other. So Shaul gives him the benefit of the doubt, but also sticks a jab at David, in my opinion, saying that, you know, it's probably that he's, taho, he's not Tahor, he's Tameh, because he's not a, not a Tahor guy. Verse 27, what happens the second day? And the, I think Yonatan and David kind of anticipated that Shaul would give him a day. Um, that's why they waited to hide out for the third day, because it only comes to a head on day two. And it was on the second day of Rosh Chodesh. And David's place is once again left vacant. Now Shaul gets angry. He says to Yonatan, his son, Why has the son of Yishai not arrived? Neither today nor yesterday to dine with us. Notice how he derogatorily refers to him as Ben Yishai, instead of calling him by his real name, David. That is always a term of derision when somebody calls you by the name of your father without using your first name. Verse 28, et Shaul. Yonatan, in keeping with the plan, responds to Shaul and says, Mish'ol mish'al David me'imadi ad bet Oh, David asked of me a favor, a request, that he should be able to go back to his home to Bet Lechem. Verse 29, and he said to me, let me go home, because we have our annual family sacrifice and festivities in my city. And my brother has summoned me to it. If now I found favor in your eyes, allow me to escape there and allow me to see my brothers. For this reason, he did not come to the table of the king. Interesting that David should use the words imaletana. It's a strange phrase to use for somebody who simply wants to, a day off to go and, and, and eat with his family. Usually lehimalet means to run away, escape somewhere. Um, they translate it here to slip away, right? To kind of like inconspicuously leave. But imaletana is used in many different contexts. For example, it's used when Lot is running away from Sedom, he tells the Malach, Imaletana, let me run away to this particular spot, to Tzoan, to, to Tzoar, the small town, so that I could escape the fire and brimstone of God who's destroying the Sedom. Hahara um, Himalet, they tell him, run away to the, to the, uh, to the, to the hills. Um, so sometimes this word Malat, Mem Lametet, really connotes escape. It's almost like a little hidden idea that David is escaping out of the clutches of Shaul to go back home. Uh, that's not what it means in this context, but it's hinted to in those, in those kinds of words. So what is Shaul's reaction? This is what we've been waiting for. The plan is all in place. Everything is going to a T as is. 
And here comes the moment of truth. What is Shaul's reaction to Yonatan giving David the slip? Verse 30, Shaul's anger flares up against Yonatan. And he says to Yonatan, he has harsh words for Yonatan, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. I knew it, that you have chosen to go on the side of Ben Yishai. In embarrassment and shame of yourself. And to the embarrassment of the nakedness of your mother. Verse 31. All of the days that Ben Yishai lives on this earth. Neither you or your kingship will be secure. Almost in a delusional way, Shaul still believes that the kingship will continue to his child, Yonatan, despite having been told by the prophet Shemuel explicitly that the kingdom will be taken away, not only from his children, but from Shaul himself during his lifetime, as it is since David has been coronated. Now then, have him brought to me, for he is marked for death. So Shaul goes at Yonatan, and he goes at him hard, calling him a rebellious son, somebody who is embarrassing himself, his mother, the family name, by not wanting to hold on to the crown, by not pledging loyalty to his father and to his malchut and to his kingdom, rather choosing Ben Yishai, in his words, David, and subscribing to David and, 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 and be showing his loyalty to him. Yonatan, despite seeing the anger of his father, presses him a little bit more. Doesn't just take that at face value. Verse 32, et Shaul aviv. Yonatan says to Shaul, his father, elav. He says to him, Lama yumat me'asa. Why should he be put to death? What has he done? I like the translation here, Vayan, is that he spoke up, like ve'anita ve'amarta. The word ana sometimes doesn't mean to respond, but it means to speak up. In other words, Yonatan fired back at his father. He did not just simply take what his father said and said, yes, dad, in a meek, timid way. He says to him, what did he do? Why do you want to kill him? Verse 33, when Shaul has no answer for these questions, it is simply a bout of jealous rage. Shaul turns to physical harm towards his son. Verse 33, At that statement, it enraged Shaul, he threw the spear at, Sha at Yonatan, his own son, to kill him. Similarly to what we've seen in the previous two chapters that he tried to do to David. Once again, he misses. Here it doesn't say that Hashem, um, it doesn't say that Hashem helped him, although maybe it is that Hashem helped Yonatan in the same way that he helped David. Maybe Shaul missed purposely despite throwing at him. Maybe it was just a scare tactic. Not 100% clear. But one way or another, uh, it definitely puts Yonatan on the spot. At that moment, when Shaul cannot answer a logical, rational question and is throwing the spear at him, and we note that there's no Ruach Ra'ah mentioned anywhere over here, which was the claim according to the Radak that Yonatan had at the very beginning that his father only wants to kill him should he be un, you know, taken over by Ruach Ra'ah. No such Ruach Ra'ah is mentioned over here. Yonatan knows that the, Shaul is not under the influence of the Ruach Ra'ah. When all of that comes to a head, Yonatan knows ki me'in aviv lehamit David, that his father is determined to kill David and nothing can persuade him out of it. At this point, Yonatan shows his loyalty to David. Verse 34, Yonatan rose from the table in rage. He ate no food on the second day of the Rosh Chodesh meal. He walks out of the meal, out of the banquet hall, without having touched his food. He ne'etzav el David, because he's grieved about David, ki hichlimo aviv, and because his father had humiliated him in public over the fact that he chose David and attempted to, uh, an attempt on his life in public in front of others. In here, the chapter comes full circle. Notice the word ne'etzav, because he was grieved about, about David. Don't forget that David had told Yonatan earlier in the chapter. I believe it's all the way up at the beginning. When Yonatan told David, no, my father would never do anything without telling me. Look at this word again. The word I believe he uses 
is Ye'atsev. Here it is in verse 3, all the way back at the beginning of the chapter. I scrolled up. David tells Yonatan, Yonatan, I'm not so sure you should be so confident that your father wouldn't tell you, that your father would, would tell you everything. I think there's a reason he wouldn't tell you. Ali eda zot Yonatan pen Ye'atsev, lest he be grieved. And in fact, that is exactly what happens. By the end of the chapter, in verse 34, as we just read, he gets up off this table without eating anything, and he is grieved about the situation between his father and David and the humiliation that his father flung towards him on that day. So now it's come to a head. It's clear that Shaul wants to kill David, not just because of the Ruach Ra'ah, but because he has it out for David. And Yonatan realizes that he's caught between a rock and a hard place. He ultimately pledges his allegiance to David. He has a berit and a shivu'ah with him. He realizes David is in the right and his father is in the wrong. But watch how this chapter ends in a very, very painful way as Yonatan is torn in two directions and ultimately torn away from his best friend. Verse 35. In the morning, Yonatan knows what he has to do. He has to inform David so that David can run away and his life could be spared from Shaul who wishes to kill him. And the day comes that they have to have a meeting, an encounter, and he takes the young lad with him. And he performs the sign of the arrows. He tells his Na'ar, Go run and find for me the arrows which I have shot. That I'm going to shoot. The young lad runs. And he shoots the arrows past him. Verse 37, the Na'ar comes to the place where Yonatan has shot the arrow. And Yonatan calls after the young lad and says, the arrows are beyond you. Keep going. And that is the sign to David that he must keep going and he must run away. Verse 38, Yonatan calls to the lad, he says, quick, hurry up, don't stop. And the Na'ar uh, gathers all of the arrows and brings them back to his master, Yonatan. Doesn't feel a thing. Verse 39, The young lad did not know what was, what was going on. He didn't understand the language that was being spoken between Yonatan and David through the sign. But Yonatan and David understood the arrangement. And without words, they know what needs to be done now. Yonatan and David are going to split. What is so surprising is you expect the chapter to end here. Okay, Yonatan has told David that he needs to run away. You'd expect the words, the next words to be, Vayivrach David. David ran away, and they never spoke to each other again. But what's so odd is that Yonatan and David, despite having this code, which was designed so that they shouldn't have to speak to each other because of the danger of having to have a conversation about it, or maybe it was designed because Yohanatan couldn't bring himself to disclose the information directly to his brother, his, his best friend, David. Nevertheless, they do have a conversation. Verse 40. Yohanatan gives the weaponry to his young lad with, his, with him. He tells him, go bring this to the city. And the Na'ar departs. 41. The young lad goes. David David emerges from his concealed position. And he comes up to Yonatan and he bows before Yonatan three times. They kiss each other. They cry with each other. And David goes and weeps even longer over the loss of his best friend. Verse 42, the final one of this chapter. David Yonatan tells his brother David, go in peace. And the words, lech le shalom, are specific in the eyes of the rabbis. There's a Gemara in Masechet Perachot that says, when two people depart from each other, they should always say, lech le shalom, go in peace. That you should have peace on your journey, you should have peace in your destination. And this is an omen that the person will find that peace. David will struggle to find that peace, but he ultimately will find it. And he reminds them of the oath. But we have sworn to each other in the name of God. That God will be between me and between you, between my seed and your seed for all eternity. What is so empty for the reader here is you may have been hoping that Yonatan would go with David. 
many of us might have said to ourselves, why doesn't Yonatan go with David? And the answer is obvious. The pull of his father, Shaul, is one that cannot allow Yonatan to escape. Yonatan must remain behind. He must be vigilant of his father. He must watch over his father. He must try to help David perhaps from the inside. Whatever Yonatan's goal over here is, he realizes he cannot abandon his father. Although the reader may have wanted to, and although I believe Chazal wanted him to, Yonatan ultimately pledges his allegiance and support for David, but physically remains behind with his father, Shaul. And what will be so painful to this is that perhaps at this moment, Yonatan resigned himself to the same fate as his father. And that is why the book of Shemuel will end with Shaul and Yonatan both dying in battle together, falling on their swords at the hands of their enemy. The fate could have been different for Yonatan had he fled and went with David and abandoned his father, but he does not. It's hard for us to judge Yonatan. Yonatan is in an impossible situation. He has a mitzvah of he must remain behind. Perhaps he thought he was more useful to remain with his father. And so he remains behind. But there's a very, a very painful statement that the rabbis make in the Gemara Masichet Sanhedrin, Daf Kofdalir Amud Aleph. And the rabbis say over here, what we'll see in the next chapter is an unfortunate situation in which David seeks refuge in a place called Nov, Ir HaKohanim. And eventually Shaul will murder everybody in that city for David having taken refuge there. And the rabbis say a very painful line. They say the following. I'll read to you the line. Amar Rav Yehuda, Amar Rav. Rav Yehuda said the name of Rav. Yonatan David. Had Yonatan only escorted David with with two loaves of bread, the city of Nov, which was full of Kohanim, would not have been massacred because David would not have needed to seek refuge there. We would not have had the debacle with Doeg HaAdomi, which we'll read about. And Shaul and his three sons would not have died altogether in battle. I believe what the rabbis are hinting to here is that at this moment, by Yonatan not going with David, he resigned his fate to Shaul's together with the rest of his family to die in battle together, but also resigned all of the other fates that are going to happen by David having to pursue it alone rather than having his trusted friend along by his side. I believe that this story leaves us a little bit empty and feeling a little bit sad because we know how powerful the bond of friendship is here. We know how powerful it is for David and Yonatan, and we see the loyalty that they pledge to each other. And what Yonatan does is far and away more than anybody would have expected him to do. Yonatan ple pledges unwavering loyalty to David in the face of what could be his own kingdom. His father, Shaul, even tells him, you chose David and you were rejecting your own kingdom. But Yonatan does not waver. Yonatan is steadfast in his loyalty to David. But that loyalty, because of the tensions pulling him in both directions that we often experience in our own lives as well, unfortunately block and prevent Yonatan from being able to go all the way. And so it's a tragic end to the friendship of Yonatan and David, uh, one that will continue to pursue, and one that will continue to have many layers there. But I believe that that's the theme of this chapter. The difficulties of friendship, the difficulties of maintaining loyalty one to the other, especially when there are other forces pulling at somebody. I think we can learn a lot from Yonatan and David and their unwavering loyalty to each other, but also how sometimes life just puts you certain circumstances that you cannot get away from and certain things that you cannot abandon. And as a result, tragedy uh, does in fact ensue. Um, so that concludes for us chapter 20. A difficult chapter to read and one that continues to pull many, many twists in the plot of David, Shaul, and Yonatan. Ver chapter 21 is now going to begin chapters of David fleeing time and again from Shaul and all of the people that get in Shaul's way and what he does to them, culminating hopefully in chapter 24 with uh, a semi-truce between David and Shaul. And so the chapters from here on in are going to deal with the continued complexities of David and Shaul's relationship, his pursuit of him, and how David will eventually win him over to be able to take his place as the next true king of Am Yisrael. Questions, thoughts, ideas, comments before we uh, say goodbye. Okay, in that case, thank you all for tuning in. I appreciate it. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you back next week, hopefully live.